Well, my name is Michael Levy. I'm a co-director of the PASS course. I'd like to welcome everybody to the PASS session on how to write CV cases. As many of you are probably already aware, the CV is a case-based exam. Unlike the exam you may have written in your home country, there are no short answer questions on the CV. The CV is simply an exam based 100% on cases. Therefore, your case writing performance will really determine whether or not you pass a CV. Regardless of how strong your technical knowledge is, you must master case writing in order to pass this exam. So the purpose of this session is to discuss how to write CV cases effectively. There's also another video which we've developed in which my partner, Ira Walfish, will actually take up a mock CV case. So you'll have a great opportunity to see how what I teach you today can be applied in actually writing a CV case. We're going to spend most of our time discussing how to write cases. But before we can do this, I will provide the following background information that you're going to need before, you want, before I can begin the discussion of how to write CV cases. There's a certain amount of basic background information you need to understand before you can write cases. We're going to start off with the structure of the CV. We'll then take a look at what the CV is testing, which again is quite different from what you were probably accustomed to when you did your original CA. We'll talk about resources available to a candidate as they write the CV. And then finally, I will explain how the CP is marked. It may be a little difficult for you to fully grasp this today, but by the time we do the next pass orbit session on November 21st, and you actually have a chance to see a simulated CP case, with both sessions combined, you'll have a full understanding of how the CP is marked. So look at it like today, you'll get somewhat of a preliminary understanding, but by the time you've been to the pass orbit session on November on November 21st, everything will come together. Before I go any further, I should mention that if you have any questions, you're welcome to use the chat box, but my preference would be that you ask the questions orally by unmuting your mic. If you do ask a question by unmuting your mic, just please remember to mute it again after you ask your question, otherwise we have feedback. Let's start with the structure of the CP. The CP is a three-day exam. The first day is a four-hour case, based on the capstone one module. Many of you are aware that there is a capstone module which all Canadian students have to attend. And in that module, the students work on a big business case. And the purpose of the capstone one module is not to teach technical or test technical, but to deal with high level business decision making. I'm sure you're all aware that due to the MOU between Canada and India, People living in India do not have to do capstone one. They're exempt. The case on day one is based on the capstone one module. In the capstone one module, you're dealing with a particular mock company. When you come into day one of the CP, you're going to write a case that's based on that same company, but they're now dealing with a new scenario a number of years down the road. Now, as I tell you this, many of you are probably thinking, how am I gonna write the day one case if I don't go to the capstone one module? Don't worry about that. What PASS is going to do is give you all the background information you need so you can write the day one case effectively. So you will not be at a loss because you did not attend capstone one. Now, understand that the day one case is the least technical part of the CP. They're testing high level business skills. Day two and day three, are really the technical parts of the CP. On day two, you're going to write what's called an elective comp. Another term that's sometimes used for the elective comp is roll comp. Both terms are used synonymously, they mean the same thing. The reason why it's called an elective comp or a roll comp is on this comp, which is one big five hour case, not everybody writes exactly the same case. The way that it works is the comp on day two will test three competencies, financial accounting and or management accounting, usually it's both. And then the remainder of the requires that you're gonna to need to deal with, that you're gonna to need to address, will depend on the role that you choose. 
And you can choose from among four roles, assurance, taxation, finance, and performance management. So let's say one person, for example, let's say Sachin decides to choose assurance. Sachin is going to have to address on his comp financial accounting, management accounting, and assurance. If let's say uh, Yogesh decides to choose finance, Yogesh is going to end up dealing with financial accounting and management accounting because everybody deals with those subjects. And then all of the other requirements that Yogesh deals with will relate to finance. So basically it's called a role comp because depending on the role you choose, what you write will be quite different. Day three, instead of writing one big five hour case, you'll be writing three smaller cases, anywhere from 70 to 90 minutes. And the three cases in total will add up to 240 minutes. So day one is four hours. Day two is five hours. Day three, again, is four hours. On day one, it's one big case for four hours. Day two, it's one big case for five hours. Day three, it's three cases adding up to four hours, adding up to 240 minutes. The shortest case is typically 70 minutes, the longest case, 90. That in, is the basic structure of the CP. Is that clear to everybody? Yes. What is, it is. yes, please, please. Uh, actually, I have a basic question. I'm sorry because I just got the email uh, day before yesterday. I was trying to, you know, I was looking out for uh, some CPA exams, either in US or CMA, or even I was searching for the CPA Canada. <clears throat> so, yeah, I have a very basic question. Like, what is the eligibility for this, for CFE? What is the Elgi eligibility? Well, basically, if you have, do you have, a, do you have an Indian CA? Uh, yes, I am an Indian CA. Then, but, you're uh, then if you have an Indian CA in good standing, you're eligible to write the CP. You don't have to do any. In order to get your Canadian CPA, all you need to do is write the CP as long as you have an Indian CA. Okay. And how about uh, I have a cousin who, who is a graduate in commerce? Okay. If they're a graduate in commerce, then it's very difficult to do the, to do the um, CPA while still in India because then you have to do a whole bunch of modules and for the modules, you'd be flying to Canada constantly. So if somebody has a degree in commerce, they can still do their CPA, but there's a lot more involved. They'd have to write a whole bunch of exams. If they're interested, your cousin's welcome to email me and I'd be happy to give them further detail. Okay? Yeah, thanks a lot. No problem. Let's talk about what the CP is testing. The CP tests the candidate's ability to demonstrate competencies rather than simply testing knowledge. If there's one thing you need to understand when it comes to the CP, is it's very different than the exam that you're likely accustomed to. On the CP, they're not simply testing knowledge. They're not asking you to regurgitate knowledge. What they're doing on the CP is they're dealing with application of knowledge. They want to see whether you have the ability to apply your knowledge. So in the case, you may be dealing with a particular accounting situation the company is facing, and you may have to apply your accounting knowledge or you may have to apply your management accounting knowledge, or your finance, et cetera. That is basically how it works. I see there's a question in the chat box. Okay, the, the guys, I just want to mention that for today's session, I'm not going to be getting into the whole, spending a lot of time in the process, because my goal today is to talk about how to write cases. So if people have questions on the process, they're much better off just emailing me uh, at some point, or watching, there is a video on the Orbit and the PASS website, a two-part video that goes through the process. So I'd rather not spend a lot of time on that today. But just to answer your question quickly, um, for, the, in order to, for the Capstone 1 case, you'll be given the Capstone 1 case by CPA Canada. But because you're not going to Capstone 2, you will have to purchase prior CP cases and marking guides um, if, because you're not attending Capstone 2. But again, if you want further detail, just email me. Again, I really don't want to spend time on that today, okay? So again, I'm not going to even answer the questions about eligibility, any further questions about eligibility. Um, if you have questions about that, that's not today's topic, and we really need all of our time for today's topic. Just email me if you have, if you have questions that, uh, that are related to the process. I'm happy to field questions today relating to our subject matter, which is how to write cases, but anything else related to the process, just please email me. Okay, so let's come back to what the CP is testing. 
So basically, it's very important to get your mind around the fact that unlike the exam you're probably accustomed to, they're not going to be asking you to recite knowledge. They're not going to be asking these theoretical questions. They're going to be simply asking you to write cases, which entails taking the knowledge you have and applying it to case facts. That's what the CP is all about, application of knowledge to case facts. I keep mentioning the word competencies. Competencies is just a fancy word for subjects. There are six subjects that are going to be tested on this exam. Audit and assurance, financial reporting, management accounting, finance, taxation, and strategy and governance. Those are the six subjects tested on this exam. Now, let's say you want to know, what do I really need to know from a technical perspective to get through the exam? So what the CPA Canada does every few years is they put out what they call a competency map. The last competency map they put out was in 2020. And that's the map that would be applicable, for example, if somebody's writing their CP in 022. And it will continue to be applicable until a new map is put out. They do not put out a new map every year. They usually only put it out every few years. What this competency map does is it literally maps out the knowledge you need to have in each of the six competencies. In case you want to look at the competency map, Sharmili will be sending you a copy of this PowerPoint. Once you have the PowerPoint, you can simply click on the um, URL and you can take a look at the competency map. When you see the competency map, it's a large document and you might find it hard to use because it's so large. So what I always suggest to my students is that the really useful part of the map is in, is really in the, what's called the knowledge list and examples, which is toward the end of the map. There's a section toward the end of the map called knowledge reference list and examples. What I would suggest you do if you're interested in seeing what's examinable in each competency is to turn to the knowledge reference list and examples, and that will tell you in detail what you need to know for each competency. Again, there's no need to look at it in detail before you're ready to write, but if you're at the point when you, that you're ready to write the exam and you wanna get an idea of what you really need to know in assurance, what do I need to know in finance, etc. I would go to the competency map. Again, um, as I mentioned, Aaron, you will be getting a copy of the presentation, okay? So don't bother to copy the address right now. Resources available <clears throat> on the CP. Unlike many other, many international exams, the CP does allow you to have what's called the CPA handbook, which has both the financial accounting and assurance standards, as well as the tax act in front of you as you write the exam. It's gonna be given to you in electronic form. The handbook is likely to be more useful to you than the tax act because most people find it very difficult to read the tax act. You can have a 96 word, uh, word sentence in the tax act. So I find it almost incomprehensible, but you may find yourself using the handbook itself. You're not going to have enough time to be constantly looking things up in the handbook. However, in cases where there's a list of criteria that need to be met, say you're dealing with, I don't know, a case comes up and one of the issues is whether we should capitalize development costs. So there are multiple criteria that need to be met. In that type of situation, you will be able to go to the electronic handbook and look up the criteria. You'll even be able to copy the criteria into your response. And then what you're going to need to do is apply the criteria to the case facts. As I mentioned earlier, you don't get much credit on this exam for reciting knowledge. So if the issue of development costs came up, you wouldn't get any credit for simply copying the criteria into your paper. What you would get credit for is tying the criteria into the case facts. And it can be a big time saver to copy from the handbook um, rather than always writing out the criteria from scratch when there are multiple criteria. But from a marker perspective, the marker doesn't really care whether you copy from the handbook and then apply to case facts, or you just paraphrase the handbook on your own. So you would do whatever is quickest for yourself. So when it comes to the handbook, just to summarize, you have it in front of you in electronic form. You can use it to look things up. But again, if you're constantly needing to look things up, there isn't gonna be enough time. If occasionally you need to look things up, that's fine. And then if you wish, you can copy and paste from the handbook into your paper and then apply to case facts. Now I'd like to talk, um, Arun asks, is, okay, Sashin asks, 
Is the electronic version searchable? Yes, it is searchable. Uh, but again, you're not going to have a lot of time to be doing significant searches. You'll want to be comfortable with a handbook before you come into the exam. One of the things we do at PASS to get you comfortable with a handbook already very early on is when we give you the technical binder, it's, it is cross-referenced with a handbook. So if we're dealing with a particular handbook section and we're summarizing it for you, we'll tell you where to find the critical handbook, sec, handbook paragraphs that you need. So hopefully you'll be comfortable with it when you come into the exam. So the, so the handbook certainly is searchable, but hopefully you're not going to be spending a huge amount of time searching for things during the exam just because of time limitation. Aaron asks, my pleasure, Aaron asks, is this like an open book exam? In this, it is a little bit like an open book exam because you do have the handbook in front of you, but it's not quite like an open book exam because you don't have any of your, you don't have any of your technical sources in front of you. You can't, for example, bring the past material into the exam or textbooks into the exam. But it's a little bit like an open book exam in that you do have the handbook in front of you. You also have the tax act in front of you. Although, as I said earlier, I don't think you'll find the tax act here be useful during the exam. Let's talk now <clears throat> about the marking of the CP. In order to understand the marking of the CP, it's very important to understand the concept of assessment opportunities. And again, if you don't fully understand it by the time I'm finished right now, don't worry. You will fully understand it by the end of Sunday after Ira walked you through a case. Because when Ira walks you through a case, you'll see examples of assessment opportunity. Basically, and for every required, there will be at least one assessment opportunity that is used to mark that required. So let's say, for example, the required is to deal with the accounting for discontinued operations. There will be an assessment opportunity that is used to mark your performance on that particular required that entailed dealing with discontinued operations. On a day three multi, these are the short cases between 70 and 90 minutes. On a given case, there's probably six or seven AOs. On the day two roll comp, there, it's a big five hour case. So there'll be somewhere between 12 and 15 AOs. The exact number of assessment opportunities, AOs is just simply the acronym. The number of AOs may depend a little bit on the role you chose. There might be one more or one less AO for one role versus another. The marking scheme I'm about to go over is for day two and day three. Day one is marked separately holistically. I'm not gonna get into that today. I'm gonna to deal with day two and day three, the technical days of the CP. Now, <clears throat> in order to ensure that you hit all of the assessment opportunities, which you really wanna do if at all possible, it's gonna be very, very important to deal with all of the required. One of the biggest mistakes you can make on this exam is to leave out a required because it's much easier to pass the exam if you address all required. One of the biggest challenges you're gonna face and this is a, a challenge that both international as well as Canadian students face, is it's such a time-constrained exam that you're gonna say to yourself, I don't have time to get through all the required. So one of the things you're gonna have to learn for this exam, which is probably runs completely contrary to what you're accustomed to in India, is not aiming for perfection. If you try to do each of the requires perfectly, I can guarantee you, you won't be able to get through them all. Why CPA Canada creates an exam where it's impossible to deal with all the requires perfectly, I can't tell you that. I don't have the slightest idea. And I personally, I think it's a little silly. But obviously, CPA Canada doesn't care much what I think. So at the end of the day, it is what it is. There isn't enough time to get through all the requires perfectly. So you're trying to deal with each required adequately rather than perfectly and make sure you get through them all. Um, Aaron asks, is there a time allocation for mark? You'll see later on when I show you the guide that there aren't any, you don't actually get a mark. So the whole question is moot. You'll see in a moment when I go through the guide. The way that the time allocation works is you're given a certain amount of time per case. So on, every, on the multi, on each case, it'll show 70 minutes or 75 minutes or 80 minutes or 90 minutes, and that's it. Let's take a look now at the marking scheme. But before we do, um, oh, Sashin asks, do the AOs have designated marking? I, I'm not sure what that means. Uh, maybe you can speak up if you want to unmute your, mark, your mic. I don't know what that means, Sashin. 
Yeah. Hi, Michael. I meant. Hi. Yeah, I meant that whether uh, the AOs are specifically marked, like it is for twenty marks, it is for fifty marks. Is it like that? No, there are no marks. That's what I was saying before. <clears throat> there are no marks. I'll explain okay. how. Instead of marks, you have something else, which I'm just about to show you. Okay, let's take a look. For each AO, rather than giving you a numerical mark, what they're going to do is they're going to give you. What, they're going to assess you at one of these five levels. If you don't address the required at all that's associated with that particular AO, you're going to be assessed as not addressed. If you address the AO, but very poorly, you'll be assessed as nominal competence. Nominal competence is worthless, buys you nothing. If you dealt with the AO, not quite at the level they were looking for, but you still did a reasonable job. It's just that you weren't at the level they were looking for, but you're kind of partway there. You'll get reaching competence. If you address the AO at the level that they were looking for, not necessarily perfectly. Competent doesn't mean perfect, but you did a reasonably good job at the level they were looking for. You'll get competent, and that's what you're aiming for. You want to get competent. You don't need to be perfect, but you want to do it well enough to get competent. So if you did a good job at the level they were looking for, they will assess you as competent, as opposed to reaching where you were only kind of partway there. And then finally, if you do an amazing job, you'll be competent with distinction. These are the five levels at which you could potentially be assessed for each AO. So there's no mark, there's no number here. Now, let's take a look now at the passing profile. In order to pass the CP, um, somebody's, Aaron, Aaron's asking, what is the meaning of assessment opportunity? Is this from perspective of a tax return repair? Or from, I don't even, I don't understand what you're asking. Yeah, hi, uh, this is Aaron. Hi. So uh, you call it as an assessment opportunity. Uh, so does this mean uh, it is uh, uh, a test for a student how good he is in uh, uh, filing a return or filling the return form? Or is this from the internal revenue service? Like in US, I don't know uh, what is the revenue service in CP uh, in uh, Canada. It's called the CRA, but I'm not sure what that has. What, what, I'm not sure what that has to do with an assessment opportunity. All an assessment opportunity means is for each required, there's going to they're going to call it an assessment opportunity. And the reason why it's called an assessment opportunity is they're going to assess which of the five levels you're at for that particular required. Okay, so this is from a student perspective, how good uh, his uh, subject knowledge is in, uh, in applying the knowledge. Exactly, that's okay. precisely correct. But what, if, let's say you got competent, what that means is that, let's say the required was to deal with discontinued operations, it means that you understood discontinued operations, and more importantly, you applied it well to the case facts. That's what competent would mean. And then region competence would mean you didn't fully understand discontinued operations, your technical was a bit weak, or you didn't apply it very well to the case facts, or both your technical knowledge wasn't strong enough and you didn't apply it well enough to the case facts. Now that we understand the concept of assessment opportunity, we can take a look at the four levels of the passing profile. In order to pass day two and three of the CP, you need to get through all four levels of the passing profile. Let's take a look at the four levels. Level number one says, was the aggregate competency demonstrated sufficient? What they're going to do to decide whether <clears throat> you pass day two and three is the following. They're going to come up with a point system, and they're going to say not addressed in nominal competence is worth zero. Reaching competence is worth X. Competent is going to be worth more points than reaching. But you're going to get the same number of points whether you get competent or competent with distinction. The only reason why they distinguish between competent and competent with distinction is so they can choose the prize winners. They have an honor roll and they have a gold medalist. They need to be able to identify the best papers. But from the point of view of passing, it makes no difference whether you get competent or competent with distinction. You basically get the same number of points. Okay? So basically, zero points for one and two, a certain number of points for reaching competence, more points for competent, and then finally, whether I get competent or competent with distinction, I get the same number of points. 
all they're going to do for level one is add up all the points. And if you hit a certain number, you will get, you will pass level one. Now, there's no magic number in terms of the total number you need to hit because on every CP, there could be a different number of points available. So there may be more or less assessment opportunities available. Also, it'll depend on how difficult the CP happened to be. So there's no particular magic number that you need to hit. But if you're getting confident some of the time, reaching competence some of the time, you're likely to pass level one. You don't need to be getting competent 100% of the time to pass level one. Level two focuses specifically on financial accounting and management accounting. And what they're gonna do for level two is they're going to ask, you, they're going to ask themselves, did this candidate get enough debt in either management accounting or financial accounting? Now, what does getting enough debt mean? What it means is, did you get competent a sufficient number of times in either management accounting or financial accounting? If you got competent enough times in either of the two, you will pass level two. Level number three focuses completely on the day two comp, the role comp. And what it does is it looks at your performance on whatever role you chose, whether it was assurance, tax, finance, or performance management. And what they're gonna do for level three is they're going to just look at the AOs that related to your particular role on the comp. So let's say on day two, I chose assurance as my role. For the purpose of level three, all they're gonna do is take a look at how did I perform on all the assurance assessment opportunities that came up on day two comp. If my friend chose finance, They'll take a look at how she did on all the AOs that came up in finance. To pass level three, you will need to get competent a certain number of times. Doesn't mean you have to get competent 100% of the time, but you'll have to get competent probably on a little more than half of the AOs that related to your particular role. Finally, we have level four of the passing profile. For level four of the passing profile, what is going to happen is they're going to take a look at <clears throat> your performance across all six competencies. And what they're going to do for level four is they're going to say to themselves, when I look at all six competencies over the course of day two and three, so I look at all the cases that came up over the course of day two and three, they'll ask themselves, did the candidate get at least reaching competence a certain number of times in each of the six competencies. What they're trying to achieve when they look at level four is they're trying to make sure that you have at least a basic knowledge across all six competencies. So I might not be very good at finance, let's say. So I may be able to, I can pass this exam without ever getting competent in finance, but I'll have to at least get reaching competence a certain number of times. All they want to make sure for level four is that you're capable of getting at least reaching competence a certain number of times in each of the six competencies. They want to make sure that you have a reasonable breadth of knowledge. So at the end of the day, you need to pass all four of these levels in order to pass the CP. Now, again, if you don't fully understand the passing profile now, don't worry. I don't expect anybody will until you start to see cases. Um, Okay, when it comes to selecting the depth area for day two, again, I'd rather not get into that today. I'll tell you why. It's premature to think about this now. I constantly get students calling me this time of year and saying, which depth area should I choose? It's too early. You have to see more cases before you can make up your mind. You don't need to choose your depth area until a couple of months before the CP. And by then, you'll have written a whole bunch of cases and you'll be in a much better position to make your choice. Obviously, you want to choose the depth area that you're strongest at. So if I feel I'm strongest at assurance, I'll choose assurance. If I feel I'm stronger at finance, I'll choose finance. But I would not try to make that decision yet until you've written some cases. After you've written some cases, at that point, what I always tell my students is, at some point in the new year, maybe January or February, at that point, if you're not sure, give me a call and we'll discuss it. 
but I never like to discuss it with students this early because quite frankly, it's not meaningful until you've written some cases. What I'd like to focus on for the remainder of today's session is on how to read a case and how to write up the case. And then as I said earlier, Ira will apply this when he does his session on Sunday. When it comes to reading the case, we're gonna talk about how to identify required, how to assess your role, assessing the nature of the engagement, considering the specific competencies being tested, and very importantly, we'll talk about ranking. Because you don't have time to do everything perfectly, it's very important that you allocate your time between the requires in an optimal fashion. So you use your time as efficiently as possible. Because it's such a time constrained exam, if you don't do a good a job of ranking the requires and allocating your time efficiently, it's very hard to pass this exam. So we'll definitely spend a few minutes on ranking. In terms of writing up the response, we'll talk about keeping in mind your professional hat, analyzing major issues, We'll talk about concluding and recommending. And then finally, we'll talk about communicating with impact. So let's start by talking about reading the case. When it comes to reading the case, it's impossible to read a case, even a multi, which is shorter than a comp, can still be five, six, seven pages long. So unless you're an absolute genius, you can't just read the case, memorize all the facts, and start writing. That's next to impossible. So the only way to keep track of the facts is by doing what's called an outline. And when Ira takes up the case with you on Sunday, he will show you how to construct an outline and you'll have a much better understanding of how you keep track of the case facts. A good outline provides a roadmap that you can then follow as you write up the case. It'll result in a well-organized response and a happy marker, and a happy marker typically translates into a happy student. By doing a good outline, it also helps you avoid forgetting to deal with a key issue or a key fact. Because on the outline, you're keeping track of the key issues and you're keeping track of the key facts. Then when it comes time to write up the case, you can then follow your outline in order to write up the case effectively. Excuse me, Michael, on the rule, yes. uh, example, if it is an audit and assurance, uh, will it be like a partner from the side of a partner I have to reply, or it can be uh, from uh, audit assistant, uh, I have to reply to the case. Will it be like that? <clears throat> usually on the cases, you're not usually a partner. Usually you're an associate and the partner, and you're working for a partner. So in a typical case, the partner will ask you to do certain tasks. So you're typically not at the partner level, you're something below the partner level. Yeah, thanks. No problem. The, the rule of thumb when it comes to how much time do I spend reading and doing my outline versus how much time do I write? You're, keep in mind, you're doing the outline as you're reading the case. So the bottom line is, as you read the case, you should be spending about a third to a, qu a quarter to a third of your time reading and doing your outline, leaving over two thirds to three quarters of your time to write the response. In most cases, it should be about a quarter of the time reading and three quarters writing, Occasionally, you may need as much as a third of the time to read, but usually it's about a quarter of the time reading and doing your outline and three quarters of the time writing up the case. Yes, Deepti, you had a question? Deepti, I think you said you have a question. Did you wanna, okay. Did you wanna ask your question? Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to continue then. Now, you would keep the outline on a separate piece of paper, or some people like to do the outline on their computer. You can either do it manually, or you can do it on your computer. People also typically make little notes in the margin of the examination paper. Also, people often like to underline background information. What often happens on cases, is they may give you some basic background information before you even know what the requireds are. So what people will often do is underline that. They may tell you in the second paragraph of the case before you even know what you're required to do. They may tell you, for example, 80% of the company's sales are in Asia. That's an example of background information. Another term that I use for background information is extraneous information, it's the same thing. 
the extraneous or background information usually will relate to the nature of the company or the nature of the industry or the ownership of the company. I usually underline that in the case. When you do your outline, you want to keep the level of detail low. Very rarely will an outline be longer than a page for a multi. For the comp, it might be quite a bit longer than a page, and I'm not going to get into that today. But for a multi, it's generally less than a page. These are the sorts of things that I will be tracking in his outline when he takes up a case with you on Sunday. In your outline, you would typically keep track of the different required. Most of the requires are in the main body of the case. You'll see when you see a CP case or a simulated CP case on Sunday, that the way that a typical case is structured is you have the main body of the case, which is usually about a page, and then you have a bunch of appendices. Most of the requires are in the main body of the case, but there can be the odd required that is in the appendices. What else are you gonna keep track of in your outline? You're gonna keep track of issues. You're also gonna keep track of what I call salient facts, important facts you're gonna to wanna to tie back to. But you don't need to get all of the facts on your outline or you're gonna to waste too much time. You can do a lot of cross-referencing. So if there are a whole bunch of facts that relate to a particular issue and they're all in paragraph two and three of appendix two, all I would write down is the issue, and next to that, I would write down appendix two, paragraphs two and three. You can do a lot of cross-referencing to the case facts, and then in the relevant paragraphs, where the case facts come up, you can then underline. So you don't have to have every case fact on your outline. I would make ample use of cross-referencing. And again, this will all come together when Ira does his outline on Sunday. I also keep track of my outline of the types of number crunching that I'm planning to do for the case. Most CP cases, almost all of them, involve some number crunching. Very rarely, they will give you information on either key slash critical success factors. They mean the same thing, key success factors, critical success factors. They simply mean things that the company needs to do well in order to succeed. They rarely give you this information, but if they do, you'll want to track it. You'll, you may want to put down on the top of your outline what your particular role was on the case. On different cases, you, you can be playing different roles. On one, for example, on the day three multi, in one case, I might be playing a business advisory role. In another case, I might be playing a, I don't know, an auditor role. I don't typically put my role at the top of my outline, but some people like to. I find that I don't forget my role once I see it. Finally, they may give you information on constraints, things that would constrain the company from doing what they would ideally want to do. If they do give you information on constraints, there could be, for example, a financing constraint, or there could be a human resource constraint, you would put that on your outline. Similar to the case of critical success factors, um, usually you don't have information on constraints, so usually you're not putting on your outline, but I'm giving it to you just in case. When you finish doing your outline, you would then try to come up with a time allocation for each required, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. I see a question here. Can we, can we say outline is like a scratch pad? I don't know what you mean by scratch pad. Arun, I don't know what you, Arun, I don't know what you mean by that. What's a scratch pad? Is it like uh, um, a, a tool which is available uh, 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 as an attachment to the question paper where I can make note I, uh, of the issues that is provided in the case without... Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh -huh. I'm sorry? Yeah, is it, is it like an attachment or a tool that is available uh, along with the uh, online uh, uh, testlet, which I can use uh, for referencing? It's not really a tool. All you're doing is you're, st you're starting with a blank slate. And on a plain piece of paper or on the actual, um, either on a plain piece of paper or, on, or, or electronically, say in a Word document, you're just starting with a blank slate and you're keeping track of the points that I just gave you here. Okay, so it's not a tool or a program or an app. It's simply a blank piece of paper where you're keeping track of everything you see here. But again, don't worry if you don't fully appreciate this because look at today's session, as I mentioned earlier, as a companion to the session on Sunday. And on Sunday, you'll actually see Ira walk through a case and pull the outline together and then you'll have a better understanding. Okay? Sure, sure. sure thank you. Sure. 
No problem. And, and Pooja says, it's like highlighting key areas and keeping important notes. I would agree with you. You're, it's really where you're keeping track of all these areas you see here. You're trying to highlight what are the requires, what are the issues, and then you're trying to cross-reference to the key facts you're going to tie back to. When it comes to the requires, one of the nice things about the exam, which is very different from the predecessor exam that you used to have to write into Canada up until a few years ago, is that today the exam is very explicit. Almost all of the requires are explicitly asked for. There may be the odd implicit required that you need to figure out for yourself, but almost all of the requires are explicit. Very, very occasionally, maybe once on the whole exam, and maybe even less than once. In some exams, it may not be present at all. There may be a big picture required where you're not explicitly told to address something, but it's hinted at. There's some major issue facing the company and you need to deal with it. That's what I call a big picture required. There may be the odd big picture required, but again, it may not come up at all in the exam. Even if it does, it may come up just once. You may have to play on the exam. And obviously, you've got to make sure you understand what your role is so you write up the required effectively. You might be an internal accountant. There are different roles you can be asked to play. When you're playing a role, if you're working for more than one party, there can always be the possibility of a conflict. What's good for one party Always consider who you're reporting to. In some cases, as I mentioned earlier, you're working for a partner. If you're working for a partner in an accounting firm, you can use all sorts of technical jargon. For let's say an owner manager, you're, you're playing the role where you were hired to do some consulting work for an owner manager. In that type of situation, you probably don't want to use technical jargon because your typical business owner manager isn't going to understand the technical. So how technical, whether you use technical jargon without explanation or not, will depend on who you're reporting to, which can vary from case to case. Assess the nature of the engagement. These are just examples of different types of engagements that you might find yourself playing. Now, when it comes to assurance, on every CP, you'll be playing an audit role, on, at least in one case, maybe more. But on some CPs, you may also have to play a review role. Always pay very close attention to whether you're playing an audit or a review role, because that will determine the amount of the type of work you need to do. One of the mistakes that some students will make is to treat an audit like a review. You never want to do that. If they ask you to do a review, then make sure you come up with procedures that are at the review level rather than the audit level. Occasionally, you may be asked to do special engagements. Other than, in other words, engagements that do not relate to financial statements. There are different types of special engagements in Canada. That is one of the things that will be covered in the assurance technical notes in the past course. We recognize that special engagements is something that's probably quite different in Canada than from what you're accustomed to. So that's one of the areas where I think you'll find the past notes very helpful because what we'll do there is we'll go over the different types of special engagements available in Canada because occasionally you may be tested on special engagements in the exam. These are assurance engagements that do not relate to financial statements. So for example, you might be asked to deal with an assurance engagement dealing with compliance with an agreement. That would be an example of a special engagement case. Every case will test multiple competencies. So after considering the required and the issues within the required, you can have a required, which is to address control weaknesses. And then there may be a number of control issues that fall out all within the required. You may want to ask yourself what competencies are being tested. Mm-hmm. <laughs>
<clears throat> the partner asks you to discuss any significant financial reporting issues that will need to be addressed by management. He also asks you to assess the risks related to the audit, suggest an audit approach, and determine materiality. In this case, it's pretty explicit that you need to deal with financial accounting and that you need to deal with assurance, right? They mention audit specifically. So in many cases, it's pretty obvious which competencies are being tested, which competencies you need to bring to the table. In other cases, you may have to figure out which competencies to bring to the table. Here's an example where they don't mention competencies explicitly. I'm worried, and again, this is a direct quote from a real CP case. I'm worried these new ventures might distract me from my initial goals, my values, and my reasons from starting the viewing channel. This is all happening so fast. I'd appreciate knowing what other factors you think I should consider in deciding whether to move forward with the book <clears throat> and whether or not to accept John's investment offer. In this case, they don't tell you specifically which competencies to address. So in a case like this, what you would be doing is you'd be reading the appendices. I mentioned the main body of the, of the case is usually just one page followed by a bunch of appendices. Once you've read the appendices, you'll have an idea of what you're required to do. Once you have a better understanding of what you're required to do, it will become quite obvious which competencies are being tested. Let's say I determine that I'm going to have to value a business. Then I know I'm dealing with, then I know I'm dealing with finance. Let's say I know I'm going to have to determine the cost of a product based on activity-based costing. I know I'm dealing with management account. So once I've read the whole case and I have a better idea of what I need to do, I'll know which competencies to bring to the table. I mentioned earlier that it's a very time-constrained exam. The CP is extremely time-constrained. That's why it's so vital to rank the required and issues and allocate time to each required in an optimal manner. So how, how do I decide how much time to spend on each required? So the first thing I would ask myself is how important is this required to my client? The more critical something is to my client, the more time I'm going to spend on it. The biggest driver of my time, or one of the biggest drivers of my time, is how much information I have available. Given that the crux of the CP is taking your technical knowledge and applying it to case facts, the more case facts you have available, the more time you should be spending on that particular requirement. Because if you have hardly any case facts to tie back to, and you're writing a lot, do you know what that means? It means that you're probably just dumping out everything you know about the subject. And dumping out everything you know about a subject is never a good idea. Because the crux of this exam is application to case facts. So the more case facts you have available, the more time you can spend on a particular requirement. And then finally, another big driver of your time is whether you have a lot of quantitative information available. The more quantitative information you have available, to, I'm sorry, let me, let me rephrase that. The bigger the quants you need to deal, on, deal with, the more time you need. If you have a major quant you need to do, I need to do a projected cash flow, or I need to do a big break-even calculation. If there's a major quant involved for that particular required, then you know you're gonna be spending a lot of time on that. Requireds involved in a major quant typically require a lot of time. The ranking determines the time allocation. So if I'm dealing with a required where it's important to my client, I've got lots of, and I've got lots of information to work with qualitatively, or I've got a major quant to deal with, I'm going to be putting a lot of time into that required. If I have a required where I have very little qualitative information, I don't have a major quant to deal with, I'll probably be spending much less time on that required. Many requires in a typical CP, you can have on just a multi-case that's 80 minutes long, you can have six required. So if you have six required and one or two of them involve a significant amount of time, say 20 minutes, then other requires where there's very little information to work with and where there's no major quant to deal with, you may have to do it in five minutes. So there can be a huge disparity in terms of the amount of time I spend on one required versus another. I can literally be spending 20 minutes on one required and five minutes on another. One thing that is very counterintuitive is that there'll be an AO, an assessment opportunity for the five minute required, and there might be 
an AO, and there'll be an AO for the 20 minute required. Even though you spent a lot more time on one required than the other, each AO is still worth the same amount. When we looked at the marking profile earlier, we didn't distinguish between AOs. So I know it's very counterintuitive, but even though you're spending this different amounts of time on different AOs, all the AOs are still worth the same amount. Sometimes they will purposely use unclear terminology. Say, for example, they give you an agreement and you're giving advice based on an agreement. If there's any unclear terms, you'll want to make it clear that we need to clarify the term. When you're playing a business advisor role, always consider the needs of the client. If they give you any information on key success factors, which is the same thing as critical success factors, you'll want to tie back to that. If something is critical to the success of the business, then obviously you'll want to focus on that when you give business advice. Pay very close attention to the appendices. Most of the information that you need to deal with will be sitting in the appendices. Remember, the main body of the case is a page or less than a page. Almost all the information you need to work with is in the appendices. As you're walking through the appendices, the bottom line is there could be the odd new required sitting in the appendices. Most or all of the required will be in the main body. So in some cases, there are no new required in the appendices. In other cases, most of the required are in the main body, but there's the odd required in the appendices. So as you're going through the appendices, keep an eye out for new required. You may or may not find new required. Sometimes there won't be a new required in the appendix, but the appendices will provide further clarification of required that already came up in the main body of the case. Once you have a better understanding based on the appendices of what you need to do, once the appendices clarify what you need to do for the required, at that point it becomes much easier to recognize which competencies to bring to the table. Am I dealing with assurance? Am I dealing with finance, et cetera? Almost all of the critical facts that you need to tie back to are going to be sitting in the appendices. There aren't a lot of facts in the main body. The main body is generally going to be primarily background information and requires the odd case facts. Most of the case facts are in the appendices. Now that we've talked about how to read the case, what I'd like to spend the last few minutes of our presentation on is writing the case. When it comes to writing the case, it's very important to try to write professionally. Now, what do I mean by writing professionally? The most important advice I can give you is to be concise. Try to get your point across in as few words as possible, because it's a very time-constrained exam, and if you're verbose, you will not have enough time to get through the case. Keep in mind the, audit, the audience orientation I mentioned earlier. If you're writing to a partner, you can be very technical. If, say, you're writing to a manager of a business, try not to be too technical. And if you do use technical terms, make sure to explain the terms. Try to write in a professional tone, okay? Again, you don't need to be fancy in your writing. You don't need to be eloquent. There's no extra marks for being, you know, for writing in an eloquent manner, but write in a professional tone. You're not going to be marked on your spelling or your grammar or your punctuation. There's nothing in the guide to mark you on that. However, if your grammar is so poor that the marker can't understand what you're saying, then you got a problem. So I wouldn't get too hung up on spelling, grammar, or punctuation. But don't let it get bad to the point where the marker cannot follow your response. Finally, in terms of organization, typically you're going to have a very short intro, no more than a line or two, because there's nothing in the guide to give you credit for that. Then you're going to have the main body of your response. And in some cases, you may have an overall conclusion at the end. We'll discuss that in just a couple of minutes. Here are some basic case writing tips. Sometimes the requires or issues are going to be intertwined. So after you read the whole case and you've got the required sitting in front of you, always ask yourselves, how does one, are the requires intertwined? Does one required impact another required? You need to think about whether the requires are intertwined before you start writing. 
because that'll affect the sequence in which you attack the case. If required three impacts required one, I'll do three before one. Is everybody with me? So I won't necessarily address the required in the order they came up in the case, but rather I'll ask myself, how are the required intertwined? And on that base, basis, I'll decide on my sequence. Always include your full thought process. One of the biggest differentiators between getting reaching competence versus getting competent is the competent candidate always provides his full reasoning, his full thought process. That is so important for getting competent. What you're going to see when Iris starts to show you evaluation guides that are used to mark this exam when he takes up the case on Sunday, you'll see when you see the evaluation guides for each assessment opportunity that in order to be competent, you normally have to be at the discuss level as opposed to the attempt level. Attempt level is good enough for reaching competence. You need to be at the discuss level uh, for the purpose of, for the purpose of, um, you need to be at the discuss level for the purpose of getting competent. Being at the discuss level generally means, generally, being at the discuss level generally means that I provided my full reasoning. Reaching competence candidates will often say things that are 100% correct, but they often will not provide their full reasoning. And if you don't provide your full reasoning, you're only at the attempt level and therefore you're going to get reaching competence because to be at the competent level, you need to be at what's called the discuss level. And discuss level means providing your full thought process. Feel free to question management's assumptions. If management is making an assumption that seems unreasonable, say you're doing a projected cash flow and management gives you an assumption which seems unreasonable based on case facts, you should be questioning it. Now, when you're running up your case, here are some don'ts. Don't contradict yourself. That's one of the worst things you can do. It shows the marker. You don't really know what you're talking about. Don't repeat yourself because if you repeat yourself, you're wasting time. And time is a precious commodity on this exam. Don't avoid number crunching. Number crunching could be a major part of a required. And you can have a, whole, you can have a number of requireds that are almost 100% numerical. So if you avoid number crunching, impossible to pass this exam. Don't come into the exam with rigid templates. When a particular scenario comes up, I'm always going to just jot down the following points. You need to be flexible because every case is different. Try to avoid saying too many things that are technically incorrect. Let me explain what I mean by that. What I mean by that is the following. Getting competent is not just a function of saying things that are correct. It's also a function of not saying too many things that are incorrect. So at the end of the day, it's not like when an issue comes up, you can just jot down a whole bunch of points and hope that some of them are correct. Being competent means not saying too many things that are incorrect. Does that mean there can't be anything incorrect? Of course not. They're not looking for perfection. But if there's a lot of stuff that's incorrect, that's when it can start to hurt. When it comes to concluding, Remember to conclude and wherever possible, make a constructive recommendation. Very rarely will it be appropriate to just say, give up. If your client wants to do something and you're playing an advisory role and it doesn't look like something's going to work and it doesn't look like it's going to work, then at the end of the day, tell the client how to make it work. Wherever possible, try to be constructive. Don't jump to conclusions. Wait, make sure you've read the whole case before you think about conclusions. That's more of a psychological thing. Some people always jump ahead and based on half the case facts, they've already made up their minds on the conclusion. Try to avoid that mindset. Never think about the conclusion until you've read the whole case. There are three levels at which you can potentially conclude on a CP case. Number one, you can conclude on a specific issue. The issue might be how to account for development costs, whether to capitalize or not. And you may need to conclude, capitalize or don't capitalize. Anytime you do a numerical exhibit, you'll always want to conclude by describing what the exhibit tells us. That's what I call a level one conclusion. A level one conclusion is concluding on a specific issue or concluding on a numerical exhibit. 
every CP case has a level one conclusion. A level two conclusion is concluding on an overall required. The required might be to decide whether the company should enter a new line of business. It could be that based on your quants and based on your qualitative analysis, I now come to an overall conclusion on that particular required. Level two conclusions are relevant on every case. Level three conclusions only come up on a minority of cases. Level three conclusions only come up in cases where you have a number of requires to address and they're all leading up to one, one big decision. In that type of situation, you would have to come to an overall decision based on those requires that led to the decision. So for example, you might have a situation where a client is trying to determine, should I enter, should I start up a business? And it could be that you need to deal with one required relating to finance and another required dealing with, uh, I don't know, qualitative analysis and another required dealing with X, Y, Z. And then on the basis of your response to each of the requires, you may then need to come to an overall conclusion. So level three conclusions, not relevant on every case, but relevant on some cases. When, uh, when you have a level three conclusion, you would come to the level three conclusion, the overall conclusion on the case, based on the outcome of the different requires that led up to that conclusion, as well as based on both your quantitative and qualitative analysis. So just to end the presentation, guys, <clears throat> what you're doing on CP cases is you're taking your enabling skills, which is your soft case writing skills, which PASS will help you develop, and you're applying you're using your technical knowledge and applying that technical knowledge to the situation, to the case fact, in order to effectively write up the case. When it comes to big picture issues, I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, they're not common on the CP, but on some CPs, there might be the odd picture, big picture type issue where you weren't asked explicitly to deal with something, but where they hinted at it very strongly. And in that situation, you'll have to deal with it even though it wasn't asked for explicitly. When it comes to these big picture issues, if they do come up on your exam, because they're not being asked for explicitly, you may have to step away from the details and see the forest from the trees in order to pick up on it. But I don't want to put a big emphasis on the big picture because it's very, it does not come up a lot. As I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, almost all of the requires are very explicit. This concludes our discussion of how to write CP cases. I hope you found this video helpful. If you have any further questions, I would be delighted to speak with you. The contact information for myself, Michael Levy, is provided on this slide. You can see my email as well as my WhatsApp contact information and Skype contact information. Please also feel free to reach out to my partner, our Walfish, his contact information is also on this slide. If you're interested in registering for the course and you're not already on our website, please visit our website, pastorcpa.ca. When you get to the website, you'll see a number of different boxes. Please click on the box that says Indian slash Pakistani CAs. Once you click on that box, you'll then be on the homepage. Please then put your cursor at the top of the homepage over past courses and click on the CP India and other international CAs course. Once you're on that page, you can read the description of the course and then scroll down to the bottom to register electronically. You may also be interested in watching other videos that uh, will give you a good idea or a good taste for what the past courses are like. We've got a, an excerpt from one of our technical sessions. We've also got an excerpt from one of our case takes ups. I would strongly recommend that you click on these videos and watch them so you can get a full picture of what PASS has to offer. We look forward to seeing you in the PASS course.